My sermon today is not dealing with anything to do with Mother's Day. In reality, every day is a Mother's Day if they're what the Bible says. But I could not help but have brought to mind in the singing of that last song, and I can see it in my mind's eye, Mother standing at the sink washing dishes or doing whatever she was doing and singing that song. I don't know how far that goes back in my memory, but I was quite small. And it's wonderful to be able to have those memories. And so my comments to all of us today is that we ought to recall those good things regarding our mothers. We're thankful that God has so ordained life on this earth that when there is a man and a woman, there can be a husband and wife. And through that means there are children and thus the home. It's all in God's doing and revealed in the Bible. We're expected then, of course, to carry out what is written in the smallest and such an important unit of any society. We have gathered here this day not because it just suited us to do it, but because we are Christians. We are of Christ. We are members of the church Jesus built that he purchased with his blood. He's the head of the body. We're the members. We're to do all things by the authority of our head, who is king of kings and lord of lords. And we have been spending time thus far praying and singing praises to him and in those songs also admonishing each other to be mindful of spiritual things, the brevity and uncertainty of life, the hope of heaven that we've talked about recently. And we must realize then that as we've assembled here by the authority of our Lord, that doesn't rule out our love of coming together in fellowship and worship. And this sharing for koinonia, which is translated fellowship, means a sharing. And thus we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And we observe the Lord's Supper, communing with one another in that fellowship as we show forth the death of our Lord till he come again as he is so ordained in his word. We give of our means and so forth. We engage in petitioning the Father together in prayer. Our minds are caused to see the needs in our own personal lives and the needs of the church here and the needs of the church throughout the world. We can express our wish to God regarding how things would be in the spread of the gospel and churches being faithful and people being uh, properly responsive to the gospel call. All of that goes on as we go through the five acts of worship in the Lord's Day service. So this morning I want to speak to you for a little while about the New Testament pattern of Christian worship on the first day of the week in particular. Let us remember we're here to worship God. And thus there should be a disposition of heart and attitude that when we're in this assembly, we are as it were before God on his throne to engage in these given acts to extol him to laud him show him our devotion and dedication to him our homage to him so in this sermon we will show that for one's worship to be acceptable to God and we all want our worship of God to be acceptable to him that it must it's imperative have the correct object. We must have the correct mindset or attitude or disposition of mind. And we must engage in the correct actions. Leave any one of those out and your worship will be vain. The Bible addresses all of these and we'll look at this for a moment. So we need to learn that it's necessary to permit God to define our worship. Not to do as we please. That's never the attitude of the faithful child of God. But to do as it pleases God. And that's taught in the scriptures. I want to begin, though we could choose many passages that deal with worship. But one of the Psalms, Psalm 95. 
two verses, six and seven. Psalm 95, verses six and seven. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, oh, that you would hear his voice. That's from American Standard Version 1901. What a wonderful statement that certainly describes what I was trying to say in my earlier comments about why we're here, what we're to be doing. And that means we're mindful of one another. That means there's an atmosphere of worship because we're before God Almighty for that purpose. And let me say then, we should be doing all we can to keep a proper reverent disposition of mind in the assembly. That means that all of us should have our minds centered on why we're here, as the Bible teaches. And we should be mindful then of not disturbing the worship. Now, we know certain things, children and so forth, can at times, because of what they are, cause a bit of a disturbance. So that means that those of us who are here and adult enough to worship God acceptably, we're not going to have ourselves so easily moved by a little distraction. So it's working both ways. We try to hold the distractions down to a minimum. And at the same time, we try because of who we're before and why we're here. We try not to be so easily distracted. That's just the way it works. It takes self-discipline. It takes our willingness to understand what the Bible teaches about why we're here. And it takes everybody cooperating with one another to realize your given situation. So you can see the psalmist was certainly declaring what a wonderful thing it is to worship God. We'll have more to say about that later. The verses teach us, they're taught elsewhere, but this verse or these verses teach us the correct object of our worship, God. They teach the correct attitude of worship. Notice he said, let us bow down. Well, you can bow down without having the disposition of heart that causes you to bow down. At the end of time, everybody will bow the knee to Christ. It's the act of submission. It's the act of homage. It's the act of acknowledging one far greater than we are, our creator, our father, the one who loved us and gave his son to die for us, and Christ who himself came and died for us. So the idea in worship is prostrating ourselves before God. It doesn't just mean a physical thing. But it begins in the heart, the mind. We must prostrate ourselves before God to worship Him acceptably in such an assembly. These verses teach us the foundation for the correct action of worship. Hearing His voice. That's the way the verse is in that I read. Today, oh, that you would hear His voice. That's simply saying, listen to what He says. Understand it. Put it into practice. After all, we are Christians because we at one point in life learned the truth of the gospel, humbled ourselves, recognizing our sinful state and lost condition, and we obeyed the gospel without gainsaying, without arguing back. We just knew the simplicity of the truth of hearing the gospel, believing in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Christ, and completing our obedience to the gospel by being buried in baptism by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Then we launched out as a new creature added to the church by the Lord, Acts 2.47, to live righteously before him, to live the Christian life, to show forth Christ living in us by keeping his commandments. Then when we come to the New Testament, leaving Psalm 95, 6, and 7, we have what we're all familiar with as Bible students, the case of Jesus and Samaria and the woman at the well. We won't go into that whole discussion. But he says to her and to all of us, but the hour cometh. And now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's imperative when you say that word must. You can't do it any other way. It's as He instructs. And that involves the attitude of the mind toward God. And I would like to simply say in the King James, if you'll notice his God is a spirit, is is a supplied word to make it work well in English. But God is spirit. He is the eternal spirit without beginning or end. He inhabits eternity. He spoke all things material into existence just simply by the power of his word. So we find the correct object of worship, God, who is spirit. Thus our spirits, our inward man, must be attuned to prostrating ourselves as the Bible teaches in our New Testament worship before Him to extol Him, the humility of heart. The correct attitude of worship is in spirit. That's what we're talking about. It flows from the inward man. It's not just a thing we go through. It is a part of the mind. You can't just be wondering about who's going fishing or what's for dinner or Whatever, you have to have your mind on God as the Bible describes that and why we are here to worship Him according to His will. So we find the foundation for correct worship in truth. Worship Him in spirit and the truth. Now, can you go through the motions of the truth? Yes, and not worship Him in spirit? You certainly can. Can you have the right spirit wanting to worship God and violate the truth in so doing? You certainly can. So it's worship Him in spirit and in truth, and it's a must for God seeks such to worship Him. Now we go back to defining that word worship. Many of you already know it. But the word that's translated worship more than any other, that is a Greek term, in the New Testament is the Greek word proskuneo. And it simply means kissing toward one in reverence. Now, we always think of a kiss mainly because of Hollywood and romance stuff as the holy smooch. It had nothing to do with it. It was the oriental custom and still is in some places and that you touch the lips forward. You can see it among some of the Arabs today when they do this kind of thing. It is a reverent, polite gesture. We tend to do it from the standpoint of a handshake. And uh, you see Paul saying, uh, to the Christians, salute one another with a holy kiss, not a holy smooch, <laughs> holy kiss, a holy touch. The churches of Christ salute you, Romans 16, 16. So the idea of proskuneo is the idea of the spirit of the child of God redeemed by the blood of the Lamb has come with others of like nature, and we are bringing our lives in subjection to the truth regarding worshiping God and in so doing, helping one another. It is the reverent, to look at the American Heritage Dictionary, the reverent love and allegiance according a deity. Webster says, to honor or reverence a divine being. Uh, in Little and Scott's classic Greek lexicon, make obeisance to the gods of their images. That was the way the word was originally used. So it had a long usage in the Greek language for years before the Koine Greek was available in the first century to describe that obedience, that humbling of oneself, so much so that you fall prostrate before the one. You can see that disposition of heart. Uh, if you read about the kings, when one would uh, many times uh, conquer another nation, on some of the inscriptions you will see as one king boasts his great accomplishments and he conquered another nation, and there may be carved there him with his foot, on a prostrate king before him. So they understood that. We today cannot get by with the idea, well, I didn't sing. I just sat there and worshiped in my heart. No, it involves an act, an act that flows forth from the heart, an act that is in harmony with the word of God as it instructs us. In the New Testament, those soul actions in which the Christian engages so as to especially show reverence to God, show his obeisance and honor God as well as his son, Jesus Christ, and what we're interested in. And Jesus had a great deal to say about worship. And I'm thinking now again on the first day of the week. Because the Lord's Supper is authorized to be taken off in the worship assembly of the saints of a congregation on the first day of the week. 
Otherwise, any time that you worship God, you're going to follow through with singing and praying and so forth. And we're even taught that he should therefore have opportunity to do good to all men, which means if you made your proper contribution on the first day of the week, you can go over and beyond that. Isn't that amazing? And give as you have opportunity on Tuesday, individually. So there's always the servant mentality of the faithful child of God. A servant is always doing the bidding of his master. He's not stepping out on his own. He has the authority of his master. And so it is when we come together, we've come together because God wanted us to. We didn't come together because we think we will. God has on this first day of the week called us together to engage in the acts of worship we read about in the New Testament when it comes to lauding God and bowing down before him at his feet. Now, we want to talk about our object of worship for a moment because there's so many people that don't understand that. Frankly, if you look among so many people, the object of their worship is simply themselves. Just look at what goes on. You, right now, in, in a matter of a few miles around us, there's everything in the world going on in worship. Most of it's because that's what I like. You can see it on some of these community churches to where they've got virtually a... a some sort of show that could be performed on some theater place all the way down to those that are more mindful of being as we try to be here. And yet they may introduce some element into it that you can't find in the New Testament because they have the attitude like Cain of old. I will worship God and because I worship God He'll take whatever offering. That's what got Cain into trouble. Yet when you read the great chapter on the faithful servants of God that are examples to us, faithful servants under the Old Testament, Hebrew 11, Hebrews 11 and 4 says that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Well, why was that the case? Well, it's by faith. That means he received instruction from God because faith comes from hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Well, then they both received instruction from God. Well, then why wasn't Cain's offering in worship in that patriarchal age acceptable to God? Because he didn't do what God said, do it the way God said, do it for well, the reason God said, do it. One of those. He may have had fully in mind, oh, I want to worship God. But he didn't offer up the right offering. And God did accept it. Right there in the beginning of the Bible, it tells us just because you want to do this doesn't mean God will accept it. That seems to be one of the hardest things for mankind to get over. And it's even true once you are acceptable of God, because look at fleshly Israel. They constantly rebelled against what God through the law of Moses told them to do. And then Paul had to predict, as others did, a great falling away from the faith before the New Testament's fully written. So people have not been in general disposed to constantly with regularity be obedient to God, whether it's worship or any other activity in their life. They are disposed to say, seems all right to me. I don't see a big problem with it. And if my heart's right, I'm sincere. And I love God and I love Christ. He'll accept it. Well, I don't know of a better illustration of how the devil causes us to be deceived. And if you think back to Mother Eve, you'll see that working pretty well with her to get her to violate God's will. Nobody can say that Eve was not sincere in what she did. The problem they don't realize is you can be sincerely wrong. And that's what they won't realize. Now, some view worship as pop psychology they comfort themselves in their own minds with thoughts of some sort of spirit swooping around them and keeping them and such thinking that God takes care of, of them in this way and pretty much whatever they do God's going to stop them it's sort of like a little toddler going down a road and there's a briar patch on one side and there's a snake crawling across the road and there's a big mud puddle and you're stumbling down that road and God's just going to keep you out of the mud puddle off the snake and out of the briar patch. He's just going to do that. And that's the way people look at it without realizing they are obligated before God to learn his will and submit from the heart to it. 
Colossians 2.18 makes it clear about this. He's writing to Christians, remember, that no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility (coughs) and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The end of that's where we want to start. Vainly, pointlessly puffed up, proud by his fleshly mind. How do you have a fleshly mind? The mind literally is not flesh. The brain is. The mind is not so. You're thinking on the level of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You're purposing and meditating on the affairs of this present world. And you see things without aid of the instruction of God's word, even in worship. Thus, we don't see anything wrong with it. And if you talk with a lot of people, that'll be the answer they give. I don't see anything wrong with it. My answer to them is, I know you don't see anything wrong with it because you don't see it through the eye of faith because you don't know how faith comes. But the sad part about it is it's been in the church over the last 50 years. More and more people have embraced denominational doctrine all sorts of ways, all because it doesn't make any difference. And they've attacked the whole approach to ascertaining Bible authority from the New Testament. Which, of course, when they do that, that leaves it free for them to do as they please. There are some who view worship as a form of personal entertainment. We all know that. The psalmist writes, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. That doesn't sound much like a lot of the worship assemblies you see around here. (laughs) You see everybody doing the holy jump up or whatever it is or some form of it. It's all a big time. But that's not what you picture from Psalm 96, 9. You see something that has more to do with the inner man, the mind and thinking and a reverent attitude of who we're appearing before and the holiness of God and a determination to let the word of God guide us. Holy worship is worship then that is sanctified and set apart for the express object of God. In other words, it belongs to him. You don't run around singing hallelujah, praise Jehovah at the football game because they scored. That song and those words express exactly what's going on if a person has the right disposition of mind toward God. Some view worship as a form of self-expression. God does not need us to express ourselves in worship. Listen to what is said in Acts chapter 17, verses 23 through 25. Paul's talking about the idolaters' pagan worship of the Greeks. He's in Athens. And all of that idolatry had just stirred him up greatly to tell them the truth about God. And here's what he said as he begins to address these people in part. He says, As I pass by and beheld your devotions, He doesn't deny they're not showing their devotions and what they're doing. I beheld them. I saw them. I knew what you were up to. I found an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. He didn't say they weren't worshiping. I've seen your devotions, and you're worshiping him, but you don't have the proper information. You're void of the information you need. You are ignorant. He says, him declare I unto you. Now watch how he does it. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all life and breath and all things. In other words, when you approach God, you approach him on his terms if you approach him properly. We, of course, must remember if we're Christians and all that that means in the New Testament, we know why we're coming together for we have the authority of the Lord saying come together on the first day of the week. And we know what we do in that worship. We know the obligations to be faithful in worship on the first day of the week. And we have our mind worship accordingly. There are some people who live an ungodly life throughout the week. Or at least... They don't spend much time in Bible study and prayer or thinking about the things they ought to do as a Christian Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then they come together on the first day of the week 
and they're trying to get their mind in gear, and their view of spirituality is some great spiritual experience. And they've got to have some sort of high to make them feel like they're all right. And that's the reason a lot of these places keep doing more and more different things, brass bands, and somebody jumping on a trampoline. They've got to do that and say, well, this is how you feel good. And that's the main thing in life, feel good. <laughs> so we must understand that he's saying you can't offer worship and it not be acceptable to God. You're ignorantly worshiping God. I want to tell you how to do it. Now, he was eating with pagans, but it works the same way among us today. The truth comes from the same source from which he received it. Then the object of worship is, again, I said this earlier, is not our fellow man or ourselves. Some actually exalt and worship men. Of course, it would be false worship. This is what Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. First of all, if we, if we would just do the first thing he says here, we'd keep ourselves out of a lot of trouble in every area of Christian living. Let no man deceive you by any means. That means if I'm deceived, I had to cooperate with it. Deception means somebody's lied to me but told me that as a truth that I've run off after it and left the truth. Let no man deceive you. It also tells us from where the deception is going to come. Let no man deceive you. And notice, no matter what he does, how he looks, by any means. For that day shall come, except there, um, but that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he has God, he has God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. <clears throat> what is Paul saying? There'll be somebody come along and actually allow you to worship him as if he were God. Don't do it. Worship, remember what it is? It's an it's a attitude of the mind. It's a falling before somebody so obeisance, I'm obedient to you. When people approach the Pope and they kiss his ring, what in the world are they saying to the Pope? You got a pretty ring, Pope. And when you go through the Vatican door there to this day, there's a statue standing there for a hundred of years, and, you, and it's supposed to be a Peter, and you'll see the big toes kiss completely off of it. How do they do that just for fun? How fast can we wear this stone down? We'll kiss it till we find out. No, it was showing homage, obeisance. Well, we don't do that. Well, look at what else you do. You can do that with the wrong attitude toward anybody. Well, then there are some who view worship as a way to keep peace in the family. Psalm 22 and verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. If your attitude is to keep peace in the family, and that's all that guides you, your family has become your God. Because that's your goal. Keep peace in the family. It's interesting that the Lord in his earthly ministry made it very clear that if you really are faithful to God, there's going to be some of you have enemies and they're going to come even from your own household. There's some people can't really stomach that. And the reason why is their loyalty, their dedication is more to their family than to God. I thought I was going to get run out of place one time when I pointed out that some people's loyalty is to the blood of their family than to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Well, that's the truth, isn't it? If it's not, then I taught false doctrine. If I don't change, I'm going to be gone to the wrong place. But the Lord taught over and over again, service to me takes precedence over any other human, family or whatnot. And yet over and over again, people have embraced false doctrine to try to justify someone in their family who engaged in sin or else just to keep peace. As one preacher said one time, I'm just not that peaceful. 
Some view worship as a big social club. That ties into some of these other things. And in doing so, they want to meet together and make the rules and the regulations of it. But I won't belabor that point. It's plain from Colossians 3.17. And Jesus sets the rules and regulations. They're set out in his word, and we're expected to study it to show us it was approved and know how we ought to act before God because we can read his will and understand it. Matthew 15.9, Jesus made it clear about people like this, but in vain, pointless, worthless worship, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. That doesn't have to be just a formal church manual or discipline or catechism. That's just simply letting your views dominate and set aside God's views in the matter. So when we're worshiping, we've got to have these things in mind. And that carries us then to the idea that some view what we're gathered here to do now merely as a way to help others with earthly problems. You look at so much of what comes from the pulpit and <clears throat> what's being said, and you think it's just one collective psychology group. And they don't view the fact that he who made us what we are psychologically in every other way has revealed his will concerning what we ought to do and how to keep our minds straight. We studied in class this morning in the back that uh, God's given us that which gives us a sound mind. <laughs> well, if, if we want a sound mind barring a blow to the head or some disease or something like that, then we have the power to have it. People don't understand that. If I'm a normal human being and my faculties are working right, God says you have the power to have a sound mind, a wholesome mind. And it comes through proper disposition toward God and His Word and Christ and our obedience to the same. Some of them will worship angels. Have you ever wondered why Why is it that people like angels so much? Now, I'm not speaking against angels as God created them and the work they do. Of course not. They're heavenly spirit messengers. They were never made on the level of man, and they were never given an opportunity if they fail to repent. I don't understand what that's like. But you know, angels, it's just sometimes what amazes me. According to the teaching of the scriptures, everything you want to read about them, we won't rehash it here, Angels don't really understand redemption. They've never been redeemed. They have no possibility of sinning, repenting, and coming back. The Bible never teaches that. Now, people sure like angels. Well, I like them in the scope in which God has put them, in the viewpoint he gives us. But listen to Hebrews 1.6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. So I know what angels do as spirit beings. They worship him. They show homage to him. They're demonstrating their obeisance to him. So the object of our worship is God. He's deserving of worship because he's holy. In Psalm 99.5, Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Nothing else is worthy of worship. Matthew 4.10, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And not even angels are worthy of worship. Revelation 22, 8 and 9, the apostle writes, Inspired of the Holy Spirit, the last book of the Bible. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am the, thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. People tell you angels come here telling them this, that, and the other, and what they've told them is contrary to teaching the Bible. You ought not listen. And Paul would say plainly in Galatians 1 that though we are an angel from heaven teaching the other doctrine unto you than that which you receive, let him be a curse, let him be cut off, the Greek says. Now listen to the words of old Nebuchadnezzar of long ago as it's recorded in Daniel 3 and verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. And, of course, that came after the time that they were cast in the fiery furnace. And the king looked in and said, Did we not throw three in? There's a fourth man walking around down there. And it's thought even here that that fourth was the pre-incarnate Christ as the executor of the Father's will doing that. All that written aforetime for your learning and my learning. Our attitude and worship, it's not just to come here this morning and get our tickets punched. I'll read some scriptures. First of all, in the Old Testament, Micah 6, 6 through 8. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And that was the way it was, the attitude of the Jew, if he was acceptable to God. But then we come down to Colossians 2, 20 through 23 in the New Testament. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all it appears to the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and all worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. In other words, you can go through all that, but you don't have the authority of the Lord behind it. It will not be acceptable no matter what all it looks to people or how all it looks to people. We must put aside all worldly concerns when we're in this worship. We are to focus on the spiritual. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. And that's not only just when we are assembled to worship. It's every day of the week. And thus, when you do come together, then this is applied like any other thing in the world as we live the Christian life. I won't read Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, but there's where we're taught to draw near with a full assurance of faith, remembering our faith in God, our trust and belief is built upon the thus saith the Lord proposition. Romans 10, 17. We must have the attitude of the broken and contrite heart. I again appeal to the psalm, Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contract heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. What does that say about our coming together and how we should frame and keep our minds? Isaiah 57, 15. The Messianic prophet said, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. Does that sound like a Punch and Judy show in the worship? Isaiah 66, 2, the prophet again says, Thus saith Jehovah, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What manner of house will you build unto me and what place shall be my rest? For all these things hath my hand made, and so all these things came to be, saith Jehovah. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and that trembleth at my word. Romans 2, 29, Paul said to the church at Rome, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision of that, that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now I've dealt, if you've noticed, as we close the lesson, with the disposition of heart that should be already formed and growing in a true Christian, a member of the Lord's church, when we assemble to worship. Which means we are working on these things every day of the week as we strive to carry out the work of the Lord. 
So from time to time, let us resolve that we consider our conduct in the worship. How we should be mindful of others as we are certainly mindful of ourselves and to keep the proper atmosphere of good worship of God in fear and in love. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're not ready to worship God. Your worship won't be acceptable any more than Cain's. So we ask you, as we've studied, to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's the only way to become a Christian. There is no other way. And to try to do it another way, said, I'll do it myself. And that won't work. The child of God, you know your heart. You know where you stand. You know what needs to be corrected and what doesn't. So if you need to correct things, you know the way to repent of sins, confess them, pray God for forgiveness. Thus, we come to this part of the sermon when we offer the invitation to anyone that wants to respond needs to respond. And we do so while we stand and sing. <laughs>